All right. Um, so we are on our last lecture before our reception, and uh, it's going to be with uh, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kessler from uh, Stanford University, Art and Art History Department, and she is going to speak to us about uh, visualizing space there and back again, seeing ourselves through telescope, satellite, and space probes. Seeing ourselves. That is beautiful. Uh, and I wanted to say that you're sponsored by the Berkeley Center for New Media, and we're very happy to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Please welcome Elizabeth Kessler. Well, thank you to Greg and to Laura for organizing this and to the Berkeley Center for New Media. It's been, and thank you to all of you for coming and staying to the very, very end. Um, and uh, hopefully we've had enough coffee to be awake and, and, and energetic through all this. Okay. So in 1968, just over a decade after the Soviets launched the first artificial satellite and only a year before Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, the husband and wife design team of Charles and Ray Eames made a film they called A Rough Sketch for a Proposed Film Dealing with the Powers of Ten and the Relative Size of the Universe. And that rough sketch and then the more polished version of it, which was made in 1977 and that I'm showing you here, have profoundly influenced how we see and experience the universe. From a picnic in Chicago, the film zooms us out into space, tracking a path that takes us out of the solar system, out of the Milky Way, and ultimately to what the narrator describes as the limit of our vision, 100 million light years away. The trip exemplifies what the art historian Stephen Bann has called the semantic recoil of space exploration. In a global era when transportation and communication networks regularly send people and information circumnavigating the globe, he argues that humans have shifted the direction of their gaze in a search for new frontiers of knowledge. He writes, quote, the immeasurable in the horizontal dimension is succeeded by the approach to the immeasurable verticals, the conquest of space, of the depths of the sea, and the earth, end quote. For Ban, a turn to the vertical, quote, restores the sense of limit and unlimitedness, which has been lost in the horizontal domain, end quote. In other words, it reestablishes a realm that lies beyond our vision, beyond our reach. So as the Eames film demonstrates, the turn to the cosmos dramatically increases the scale of the limits that we are attempting to surmount. A person could walk around the world within the span of, the f of a few years, but the vastness of the universe defies our physical and technological capabilities. NASA's latest estimates suggest a manned rocket could make a one-way trip to Mars in six months. But the closest known exoplanet, so a planet outside of our solar system, is 11.7 light years away. And the closest galaxy, Canis Major Dwarf, is 25,000 light years away. And even if we could conjure up sophisticated technologies that would enable us to travel these kinds of immense distances, we would still run up against an event horizon, a frontier that the expansion of the universe prohibits us from ever crossing. So what to do with these kind of mind-bending spatial and temporal scales? How to make sense of times and spaces so far beyond human experience? And I want to propose that we bring them back to our own time. We remake them into familiar places. And I want to demonstrate that today by talking briefly about two examples, the Voyager Golden Record and the Hubble Space Telescope images. These are two great triumphs of NASA, both in the level of science and as public relations. And they both have extended our reach and our experience along this vertical axis of exploration that Van is uh, proposing but while simultaneously repre representing that new realm in recognizable forms. Okay, so the first section is about distant time. So <coughs> NASA launched the Voyager missions on their vertical trips, a grand tour of the solar system in 1977. Um, and the space probes gave us our first close-ups of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and their moons before then continuing out to the edges of the solar system and then on into interstellar space. And NASA has recently confirmed uh, that Voyager 1 has left the solar system, not just left the building, um, and that Voyager 2 will do the same in the very near future, within just a couple, three years. Um, 
And in the years since their launch, the data collected by more sophisticated telescopes and space probes have superseded what these first explorers provided. Um, and although they're still sending back data, the radio signals from the probes have grown faint and our antenna will soon lose contact. Yet the voyagers will continue their travels uh, for tens of thousands of years. And the realization that these space probes could potentially last longer and travel further than any other human artifact led the astronomer Carl Sagan and several of his colleagues and friends to develop a message, which is now known as the Golden Record, for any beings that might eventually intercept them on their 10,000, multi-10,000 year journeys. It wasn't the first time that Sagan had composed such a message. A few years earlier with his then wife, uh, Linda Salzman Sagan, and his fellow astronomer and alien life enthusiast, Frank Drake, he had, together the trio had designed this plaque for the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft. It consisted of just this single panel, but the Golden Record was a more ambitious project. Over just a few months, Sagan um, and his collaborators collected an archive of images and sounds and the sounds included uh, selections of music, including some from Alan Lomax. Um, everything always connects here, right? Um, earth sounds and greetings in an array of different languages. Um, to conserve space, they decided to encode the message, both the images and the sounds, uh, as sound frequencies, which meant that the recipients would need to be able to play the record. And the records, oh, the record's uh, protective cover provides some cryptic instructions. Most of it's dedicated to that. These are the instructions for what to do. This is a map of where the Voyager came from. Um, and the Voyager also had affixed to it a stylus so that the, they would have something to run over the grooves of the record. Um, the choice to encode this message immediately raises questions about the likelihood of any being ever being able to, to decipher it. It's not entirely, it seems to me, not entirely out of the realm of possibility to imagine something, someone figuring out the stylus goes on the record and running it around and getting some sort of sound out of it. But the translation of the images requires a lot more of its recipients. The aliens must first interpret these IKEA-like instructions and then build something that's kind of analogous to a DVD player but that reads sound waves and then displays them. Um, so it's this really daunting kind of obstacle that poses endless spe speculation about its feasibility. Um, but I think that's somewhat beside the point. To use the term that Stephen Johnson suggested, it's not a blind spot in, in the designers of the record. Instead, it speaks, to, uh, speaks more significantly to the kind of aliens Sagan and his collaborators expected to find and even more so, who they wanted their contemporaries to imagine, uh, what kind of aliens they wanted the uh, their contemporaries to imagine. Um, that is, a technologically developed and scientifically minded civilization with the cleverness enough uh, to construct a device that would let them read and translate the code. So in other words, they're expecting sort of a slightly smarter version of us. Um, somewhat ironically, due to the complexities of copyright laws, um, it's actually been much easier to see the images here on Earth than ever to actually hear a collection of the music um, and the sounds. And, in a pr and also, since we're talking about images uh, largely today, I'm going to focus my comments on the visual portion. And they intended this collection of 115 diagrams and photographs to provide, quote, any possible extraterrestrial auditors with information about the Earth and its inhabitants that they are unlikely otherwise to find themselves in possession of, end quote. And so they look through encyclopedias, Life Magazine, National Geographic, the Photo Archive of the United Nation, all sorts of coffee table books to find photographs that they thought would represent our world. And the final selections portray our world as this diverse, but harmonious and bountiful place. There's an assortment of plants, animals, and sea life, all flourishing while contented humans of all ages and races engage in a variety of very useful and enjoyable activities. And then the last several photos um, all celebrate our technological achievements. In architecture, I'm not showing any of the buildings, but they have the UN building and the Sydney Opera House and a home and all sorts of, which is very 70s. Um, and then, so, so celebrating then uh, technological achievements in medicine, transportation, um, and including space travel. Um, 
not surprisingly, uh, many people have, have criticized this. The journalist uh, Key Davidson, who wrote a biography of Sagan, panned it as, quote, a cosmic equivalent of a hallmark greeting card, all sweetness and light, but no deep, dark truths, um, end quote. So this apparent omission of war, violence, greed, hunger, destruction of any type have led many to dismiss this as a naive or very false vision of the world. Um, again, though, I think that that points to maybe the wrong direction to look at this. If we wanted to show aliens what our Earth is like, the collection, of course, fails. And in fact, any set of 115 images would offer an incomplete, biased, and idiosyncratic view. But more than a message to aliens, the golden record is what I'd like to call an extraterrestrial time capsule, a form of expression and a thought experiment that uses the predicted longevity of the spacecraft to help Sagan and his colleagues, and any Earthlings who think about their efforts, to take this virtual trip in time and space by imagining the future travels of the Voyager and its message. And in doing so, it then affords us a new perspective, not only on the future, but on the present moment. And Sagan wrote about the pioneer plaque in just these kinds of terms in Cosmic Connection, um, which is a book from, from about 73 um, that really kind of helped to make him famous. His, his appearances on The Tonight Show comes shortly after that. Um, and he states, quote, the transmittal of the pioneer Tem message encourages us to consider ourselves in cosmic perspective. The greatest significance of the Pioneer 10 plaque is not as a message to out there, it is as a message to back here, end quote. So we might think about the Voyager's shiny uh, golden record as a kind of mirror for the inhabitants on Earth, one that presents a kind of ideal reflection. But at the same time, it offers a subtle warning of the uncertainty of the future on Earth, of the threat that's on the flip side of the technology this record celebrates. The collection comes to a close with a photo of a Titan Center rocket and a sunset. And Sagan and his colleagues in the publication that they, the book they put out called Murmurs of Earth, um, give this really straightforward explanations for why they chose these two images. And they say, well, the Titan rocket is what launched the Voyager into space and sunsets display beauty. We wanted something aesthetic. Um, but the Titan rockets were developed to carry intercontinental ballistic missiles. The space side of it is sort of an afterthought, really, for what they're, they're used for. And the sunset marks the end of a day, never to be relived. Beautiful, yes, but it also speaks to the fleeting nature of time and the final light of the sun before the darkness of the night. For an audience of Earthlings in 1977, locked in the nuclear proliferation policies of the Cold War, such images bring the message back to their own time and questions about humanity's long-term survival or near-term demise. Okay, so the next section is on distant space. So while the Voyager photographed Jupiter, Saturn, and the other planets, astronomers and engineers were in the midst of designing and building the Hubble Space Telescope, an orbiting telescope that, that Kristen's paper has given us this, this fictional story around. Um, so they were predicting that that telescope would improve our view of the universe by an order of magnitude. When finally completed and working properly, and the initial focusing problems and the role of images in reviving its reputation is the subject for a whole other talk, but many of those who, once the telescope was working, many of those who were working with it looked to the Voyager missions and their dramatic images as models for how to capture the interest and imagination of a broad audience. And so over the Hubble's 25 years of operation, it'll be, its 25th anniversary will be in April um, of, of 2015, astronomers and image specialists have developed and released an impressive collection of vividly colored pictures of nebulae, galaxies, and star fields. And several of them even got together and initiated this project called the Hubble Heritage Project, um, an endeavor, and I'm showing you three different images that come out of the Hubble Heritage Project. And they took as their mission the monthly release of an aesthetically appealing uh, uh, image crafted from Hubble data. Now, many of the Hubble images demonstrate the shift from the horizontal to the vertical trajectory that I began with. 
And in two of these, uh, these are some of the best known photographs from the Hubble, the deep field and the ultra deep field. We see galaxies speckling the blackness and we gain a sense of the vast number of objects that populate the cosmos. Each of these images is a composite of observations taken over a series of days. And then this accumulation of time allows astronomers to observe, and, and I quote from the press release that accompanied the first deep field from 1996, uh, it allows them to observe, quote, galaxies to the faintest possible limits with the greatest possible clarity from here out to the very horizon of the universe, end quote. And many astronomers point to the deep field and the ultra deep field as, as among the most fascinating images returned by the telescope, stretching the instrument to its observational limits. Um, and just as a no, the, the, there's a little story behind the, the first deep field. Um, if you don't know, it's like a dime size, if you know from Earth, like about a dime size uh, swath of the sky. And it's an area of the sky that astronomers had looked at before and there's, you can't see anything from Earth, from a ground-based telescope, it's just blackness. And the director of the observatory said, let's spend a whole bunch of time looking at that black spot and see what we see. And so everyone was sort of really amazed when they looked at this black spot and suddenly, whoosh, you know, blossoms with all these galaxies. Okay. Um, so this is part of the reason why astronomers look to these as among the most fascinating images. Um, and conceptually, they speak to the limits of human vision, the limits of the universe, the limits of time. But despite the great depths that they represent, it's impossible to see those limits in the image. We can know them, but they're not made visible to us. Uh, the distance to the galaxies or between any two of them remains visually indeterminate in these images. Additional data, the redshift galaxy, or value for each of the galaxies would be needed to calculate it. Um, so although they're attempting to show us this kind of vertical frontier, they resist our efforts to see them as such. And despite this shift to the vertical, our phenomenological experience remains oriented to horizontality. horizontality. <laughs> At moments, the desire for the known overpowers <laughs> this change in our trajectory. The Hubble images have succeeded in part because they have frequently translated the alien vertical into the familiar horizontal. Many of its most iconic images resemble landscapes of the American West, such as this view of a section of the Eagle Nebula, which is often called the Pillars of Creation, in an evocative description of the star forming uh, process that's occurring within these clouds of gas and dust. And when translating the data from the Hubble into legible images, Astronomers amplify the contrast, the, the difference between the tonalities between black and white, which gives the nebula its appearance of depth and dimensionality. They assign colors to exposures that are taken through different filters um, that the, on the telescope's camera. Their choice of colors have scientific rationale. In this case, the colors indicate uh, temper va temperature variance through the nebula, with red indicating the coolest regions and blue the hottest. But the color scheme also suggests an earthly landscape with a blue sky in the background. And astronomers also choose the orientation for these images. Cardinal directions have no relevance when you're speaking of an orbiting telescope. But some astronomers still continue to follow the convention of positioning north at the top, which, which in imitation of the experience of laying on the ground uh, with your head pointed to the north. But just as often, those who work with the Hubble data make choices based on aesthetics. And in this image, north is over here diagonally to the, the left. Um, but by turning it as they have, the pillars gain the sense of monumentality and grandeur. They rise up dramatically before us. If you flip it upside down, they seem to ooze off of the screen. The Heritage Project's 10th anniversary image, a section of the Corinna Nebula that the press release that accompanied it uh, described as a celestial landscape, it demonstrates the intentionality of this shift in orientation from the vertical to the horizontal. In this image, a jagged horizon stretches across the picture, silhouetted against a cloud streaked azure sky complete with twinkling stars. A luminous line separates the sky from the form below making it seem as if some unseen light source lies just beyond view. 
the region immediately below the brilliant glow appears in reddish shadow, while areas further down brighten to light green. On the left side of the picture, the patches of green gently slope downward. On the right, they plunge more steeply. Together, these modulations in color and tone give the form a sense of three-dimensionality and mass. The image looks like a landscape, a mountain range profiled against a deep blue sky. Its peaks backlit by the final light of the setting sun, the shadows and colors revealing cliffs and valleys. Only the stars scattered over these mountains, especially that beacon that shines from the summit at the center, disrupt this inter interpretation of it as a landscape. And as a kind of unintended homage to Powers of Ten, the Heritage Project's website features an animation that locates the site of this small section of the Corinna Nebula in the night sky. But it also trans er, traces this transformation from the vertical to the horizontal. Their journey begins with this uh, telescopic view of the sky above the Earth, dotted with stars. And as with the Hubble Deep Field images, there's no means to discern the distance to the objects, although some are lar larger or brighter than others. And the Corinna Nebula is among them, over here on the right side, as this glowing red region. As the image transitions, is it, there we go. Um, the viewer travels into space, and a magnified view of the nebula comes into focus. Although it's horizontally oriented on the computer screen, the movement takes us on a vertical trip into the heavens. And as it zooms into the smaller, cloudy region, the orientation of the nebula rotates subtly. A sweeping ring of clouds fill the frame, implying a viewer who peers up at the sky. However, when the frame tightens around the small section of clouds that comprise the Heritage Project's view, the image gains a horizon. What had been a view upward into the sky becomes one with a visible frontier. In effect, through the use of images, the, the unfamiliar and unimaginably vast is translated into something known, or at least something we could come to know and appreciate. Instead of the undefined space of the deep field images, the views of the nebulae and galaxies offer a means for humans to position themselves within the cosmos. In his phenomenological account of the relationship between space and place, the philosopher and geographer Yi Fu Tuan proposes that, quote, what begins as undifferentiated space becomes place as we get to know it better and endow it with value, end quote. And Tuan writes of the spatial experience of the physical world, describing the gradual process of exploration by which the alien and strange becomes familiar. His description of moving somewhere new illustrates the process. Uh, quote, a neighborhood is at first a confusion of images to the new residents. It is a blurred space out there. Learning to know the neighborhood requires the identification of significant localities such as street corners and architectural landmarks within the neighborhood space, end quote. For the Hubble images, the cosmic neighborhood gains familiarity through its resemblance to the earthly landscape. We overlay the landmarks of our world onto the strange and undefined features of space. In the process, it becomes a place into which we can mentally travel. Powers of 10, of course, doesn't stop at the edge of the universe. Instead, it immediately and much more quickly returns to those picnickers in Chicago and then continues past the point of origin to the world of the minuscule. Similarly, the Voyager Golden Record and the Hubble Space Telescope images send us a field and then boomerang us back to our world. We use these tools for exploring space and the images connected with them to launch ourselves forward into distant time and space and then immediately make the return trip. We extend our senses through technologies, but we can't quite free ourselves from the gravitational pull of our own moment, our own place. The alien is always simultaneously us, the foreign, also our own neighborhood. From there. Thank you. Congratulations. We have a few <laughs> questions for you, maybe. And sure. I just wanted to ask, I was just thinking about this, does when we take images, please go up here. Uh, when we take images, does it always represent a kind of laying claim on a space? I mean, uh, we, when we 
we probably won't go there, but in a way mm -hmm. we want to, like putting the flag on the moon, putting the flag in, uh, down in Cuba. Yeah. Like it's, it's always like marking it as ours somehow. And even the neighborhood, and we don't own it uh, physically, but we own it culturally. Right, and well, and I think in the case of the Hubble Space Telescope images, like you said, we're not going to go there. This is so far distant. It's true, we have the hubris that someday we might own it somehow anyway. Right, or, but even if we don't own it in a sort of like, this is my plot of land, I am a homesteader, like we might talk about in those Western images, um, we can mo own them in terms of situating within our conceptual systems and the, the sort of epistemic sy systems and the knowledge systems. We come to know and understand them um, instead of remaining this sort of mysterious void, undefined and ununderstood. And, and that's not a neutral thing though. No, no, I'm not at all. Mm -hmm. I'm standing on it as well. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, here's another question for you. Uh, go ahead. And uh, any other questions in the room? I see over there and there. Okay, you didn't ask one yesterday, so you'll get an answer. Okay. So yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, it was fascinating. Uh, I understand why this, or sort of how this material could um, um, move you in the direction of the sublime. Yes. And um, so I'm a little bit curious of how that worked. Uh, did you work with the Burke mainly, or did it draw you to Kant's notion of the mathematical sublime, or uh, and how is it, you know, I guess basically that the mathematical sublime from Kant is basically based on Burke, so Kant doesn't really add very much to that, mm -hmm. except his very sort of rationalist uh, understanding of mm -hmm. the sublime in the first mm -hmm. place. So, um, uh, I mean, something really vast is kind of one um, notion of the sublime. Mm -hmm. Another is something which is not quite clear. Yeah. Uh, so that Burke is, for example, talking about things like uh, um, um, clarity is the enemy of any enthusiasm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so how, how did the yeah, notion of clarity and the vastness um, move you in this area? Right, so you're referencing things that I've written about elsewhere, the kind of connection between the Hubble images and the aesthetics of the sublime. Um, and I draw mostly on Kant there. Um, and the idea uh, in Kant that the sublime involves this um, engagement of what he talks about as the imagination, which he associates with the senses, um, and reason. And that when you're looking at something vast and overwhelming, that the imagination can't quite, and the senses can't quite grasp it. And the experience of the sublime uh, that's kind of transcendent experience comes about when reason gets it. So his example is about, as you're saying, the mathematically sublime and the infinite, that we can't actually see the infinite, but there's a moment where we, we get it, and, and our reason, our rational faculties get it, and that's the sort of thrilling uh, transcendent aspect. And so I was applying that notion um, to them, and, and talking to, I kind of gave that quick comparison of the Hubble image and the Thomas Moran, um, and the use of the sublime and the vocabulary of the sublime in um, images from the American West. So it's a book, so there's <laughs> I could talk more, but I'll let someone else ask the question. Yeah, I, uh, I thought that your comparison between Thomas Moran's work uh, and the Hubble images was very interesting in that Thomas Moran was, he played a very integral role in the US geological surveys in sure. sort of helping interpret some of this, uh, these remote landscapes for um, the viewers back at home. Yes. Um, and a lot has been written on the use of his images in the construction of national identity in this moment of expansion. I was wondering if at all in, in, your, in your book maybe, um, if you kind of address whether or not these Hubble images could maybe have a political function in terms of um, bringing people on board with the types of science that NASA is mm, yeah, I mean, there a lot of the images um, have a dual function, that they are both scientifically valuable, but also as uh, public relations, so about encouraging an enthusiasm for exploration. Um, and I think a national pride, too. And I mean, if you think about the history of NASA and the ways in which NASA was formed um, in response to Cold War politics and Sputnik and the moon landing, we got to get there first, and this is, you know, and all that kind of rhetoric of a frontier that's kind of filtering through NASA's history, I think that that's definitely um, um, an undercurrent within the images. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One more question? And then that's it for now. So it's your last question. Okay. okay. You have the last I'll word. I'll make right. it good. <laughs> um, thanks for your talk. Uh, it was really fascinating. And I um, want to go way back 
to one of the this morning's talks, um, something that really struck me in uh, Xavier Lucchesi's discussion was when he ha made the metaphor of going through into the body as mm -hmm. going down a highway, right? Yeah. And so if you think about it, the microscopic is sort of the, I guess, alter or the opposite horizon of imperceptibility. Yeah. And that um, metaphor of landscape and travel in that sort of invisible world. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, I don't know, I guess I'm just curious if you think that any of that, the way that we're approaching the body, the material body that we can't see or grasp visually in these similar metaphors mm -hmm. has any resonance with, with some of what you're talking about in space. Yeah, I mean, I think the metaphor of a landscape comes up frequently, you know, mediascapes uh, as a means to try to get a handle on these, these kinds of systems and connected systems. Um, so absolutely, I think that that becomes a valuable um, connection. I think you know it's interesting that several people, and it was a question in my mind, ask about the color choices with those images because they don't. Although this idea of a metaphor of a landscape is there, they don't because they don't match our color schemes of a landscape. They don't look like landscapes in the same way. And here. Um, I'm thinking of an example of a Hubble image where they made the colors totally different. And it was a, a, a ring nebula, so it's a thing, a, sorry, a planetary nebula, so it looks like this, right? So it looks like an orifice or something like that. And they made a version of it that was like all pink and purple. It looks really biological and bodily. And they were like, no, no, we can't do this one. <laughs> that it didn't match with what they wanted. Um, and they make these arguments about, well, that's not what the conventions of scientific representation suggest. But I think it also doesn't match with their sort of notions about, well, this is what space looks like. This is what the body looks like. And, and so there's these kind of fine distinctions, even though the landscape becomes a connecting metaphor in both scenarios. Well, we're going to end with the orifice in the sky. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>